Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship Your holy name. Well, we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 7 today and deal with one of the most misinterpreted passages of Scripture. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people know the first part of this passage um, because I, I hear it a lot. You know, Jesus said not to judge, Brent, so your opinion on, on the matter of things doesn't really matter. There's a couple things I want to, you know, we laid a foundation last week. We laid a foundation of, and if you weren't here, you can listen to our, the sermon online, uh, of whether or not God's word is consistent when it comes to sexual sin. Does it say that uh, sexual sin is wrong in the Old Testament as much as it does in the New Testament? That includes homosexuality, adultery, so on and so forth. Um, so we established that God's word is consistent all throughout when it comes to uh, moral law. Again, some of the arguments that we looked at were, you know, this is just kind of Old Testament stuff. I mean, the Old Testament, you're not supposed to eat shellfish, so... Uh, should we stop going to Long John Silvers? Um, but again, we talked about, and when, you, when you study the Old Testament, there's different types of law. There's civil law, which had to pertain specifically to the governing body of Israel. There's ceremonial law, which has to do with in specific uh, offerings and such. And then there was moral law. Ceremonial law and civil law are not mentioned uh, in the New Testament as something that is for us today. However, moral law, Jesus went over the Ten Commandments except for worshiping on the Sabbath. So we have to take seriously his commands when it comes to our morals. And I know we live, uh, our culture for the most part um, doesn't want someone dictating what you should or should not be doing when it comes to your morality. However, uh, as a Christian, if I believe God's word, um, I need to follow what it says 100% of the time. So we established that foundation. We have to establish that before we can move on to today. So again, if you weren't here last week, you can check it out on our website, bridgewaybc.com. But uh, this passage of scripture, a lot of people know if they were going to be able to quote any verse, it would either be John 3, 16, or at least part of it, or Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, at least the first two words. People say, judge not, that ye be not judged. There you go, Brent, that's all you need. And most stop at just the first two words. Uh, two words, judge not, conversation over. Again, we don't do this in conversations we have where you just pick out two words and assume that's what the entire conversation is about. Uh, that would just be foolish. So we need to look at this verse in the context of what's going on. And let's keep in mind, Jesus here is preaching not just to believers, but non-believers and Pharisees as well. But uh, some people interpret this as, uh, basically, you cannot tell me what I'm doing is wrong. Jesus said not to judge. So ultimately, you have no right to tell me that what I am doing is wrong. Uh, that assumes a couple things when you interpret the verse this way. Uh, one, that religion or faith is private and that morality is relative. That this is an ever-changing thing, Brent. There's no absolute when it comes to our morals. And you really have nowhere to say that what I'm doing is is wrong. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question real quick. Is this what Jesus meant when he said this? Did he say never tell someone that they're what they're doing is wrong when it in fact is wrong? I mean, is this, if we look at the Gospels, and again, maybe most people that, that interpret this verse that way have probably never read the Gospel narratives, never even maybe read the New Testament or the Bible itself. They just know this small passage of Scripture. Are we to assume that Jesus never told people that they were wrong? Because when you read the Gospels, Jesus, again, they killed him. They hated him. It wasn't because he went around saying, you know, if, if how you live your life works for you, that's cool. Um, who am I to say that what you're doing is wrong? You know, just do what you want to do. Is that why they killed him? No. He at times called people evil. He at times called people hypocrites. I mean, he, he made judgments about people. And we're going to look at, well, Brent, still Jesus here is saying not to judge. What does he mean by that? We'll, we'll dive into that in a second. But let's just, let's not assume here that Jesus 
never told someone that they were wrong. To judge is to form a conclusion about someone or something. In fact, if you say someone is judgmental, you just judge them by forming a conclusion about that person. So it's kind of a circular argument to a point. Furthermore, later on in this very same chapter, in this very same sermon Jesus is preaching, in verse 13, Jesus gets judgmental. Uh, he says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereout. How could he know that there are many people going to destruction without making a judgment about those individual people? Because straight is a, uh, is a gate and narrow is a way that leads to, unto life, and few there be that find it. He's saying some people get it and some people don't. How can he come to that conclusion without making a judgment? So is Jesus just having this giant circular argument with himself, saying, you're not supposed to judge, I'm just going to do it here in just a second? No. No, he's not. Basically, if, when we look at this passage in its context, and we'll look at it here in just a second, it is talking really about two types of judgment. A critical judgment, a, a judgment that is uh, um, basically hypocritical, and Jesus used that, uses that word specifically. Uh, a critical judgment is self-righteous. It's designed to hurt other people. And Christians have hurt other people by being critical in their judgment. Again, some of the worst people I've met claim to be Christians, but some of the best people I've met are, claim to be Christians. All right, so let's get, let's get that across the board, okay? Let's try to understand that, that you can't base your judgment of Christianity based upon how one person treated you neg negatively. Some are critical in their judgment. They don't represent what Christ meant when he's talking about this. And keep in mind, he's talking to some Pharisees as well, and these people were nothing but critical. A critical judgment contributes only to the problem and seeks not to alleviate it, meaning you're, you're quick to point out someone else's issues, but you don't intend on helping that individual whatsoever. It's all you're bad because of boom, 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 see you later. I'm better than you. And so Jesus is about to just lay it out when it comes to this and how we communicate to people and how we relate to people. So judge not that you be not judged. Verse 2. So let's look at a couple verses here. You can bring those up, Tom. Verse 2. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. So he's saying here, if you're going to judge people harshly, that's exactly what you're going to get. If you're caring in your judgment then you'll, you'll get care of judgment as well. He says, Why beholds thou the moat, or the speck, or the splinter, he's using an illustration, that is in your brother's eye, but considered not the beam, or the two-by-four, that is in your own eye? He said, why, why are you so concerned about this splinter when there's a two-by-four in your eye? Verse 4, How would thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat, or the speck, out of thine eye, and behold the beam that is in thine own eye. Now again, the issue here is, as we're going to see, there's a speck in someone's eye. You're going to have to make a judgment at this point. Again, you're judging that person saying there's something in your life that's not right. Ultimately, this speck is going to get removed, so you're going to have to use some type of judgment. But the issue at this point is there are people going around who have this massive two-by-four in their face, and they're saying, well, you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're wrong, when they will not even look at themselves in the mirror spiritually and realize just how messed up they are. Verse 5, thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. So at some point, you do have to make a judgment. At some point, you do have to attempt to help that individual if you're going to judge correctly. So let's ask a couple questions this morning. My first question and we should ask this as believers, how do I know, Brent, if I'm being critical in my judgment? How do I know if I'm being a jerk spiritually to those around me? And so I'll give you a couple things to take home uh, and, and apply into your life as you see fit. How do I know if I'm being critical in my judgment? Number one, you are more enraged at someone else's sin than you are embarrassed by your own. You are so mad about what someone else has done than being embarrassed about the, the fact of your own sin. Again, I'm not saying don't point out that, that someone is wrong, but when you're doing that, be painfully aware of the fact that you yourself, you're a sinner, saved by God's grace. And that even to this day, 
you still struggle with sin. You see, when you get saved, it's called justification. You, you, you're, the eternal punishment for sin is gone for you. When you become a follower of Jesus, your eternal punishment for sin has been paid for, taken care of. Your home is now heaven. And now you are here on earth where there is still sin, and now you get to struggle with sin every single day. Its presence is trying to dominate your life. That's what we call sanctification. Sanctification is growing more and more and more to look like Christ, meaning sin has less and less and less of an influence. But church, we struggle with it. We fight with it. That's why Paul uses terminology like we fight a good warfare. And you wake up, it's time to fight against sin itself, trying to dominate your life. And so when we are trying to help someone else, we must not look at it like this person is so bad, I'm disgusted with their sin, but then not be painfully aware of just how sinful you are too. Again, if we could somehow put a video camera into our hearts and mind for everyone to see, it's a dirty, difficult place that we struggle with. I like what J.D. Greer said, Pastor J.D. Greer, he said, if you are characterized by disgust over someone else's sin, rather than being overwhelmed at the forgiveness that God has given you, it means you are desperately out of touch with the gospel. Let me say it again. If you're characterized by disgust over someone else's sin, oh, they are so sin, they're so bad, this person's doing this and that and so on and so forth, without first being overwhelmed at the fact that God forgave you, Let's think about that, church. He forgave you, and he didn't have to. He cleansed you, and he didn't have to. So instead of just being so disgusted with how bad everybody else is, remember, he forgave you and didn't have to do that. And if you think that way, if you're so disgusted by everybody else, everyone else is bad except for you, you are desperately out of touch with the gospel. Basically, you're a Pharisee. So, how do I know if I'm being critical in my judgment? You get more angry about other people's sin than you do your own. Number two, you cut off those who disagree with you. You completely isolate yourselves from those who don't hold the same viewpoints that you hold. And um, this can sometimes be painted in church as a good thing. Uh, it, growing up, um, it, sometimes in church I would hear that you need to be separate from the world, so just stay away from those people and this person and so on and so forth. And um, when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus engaging people who are completely the opposite of him. You see, church, in order to reach a lost and dying world with the Gospel of Christ, you need to go to a lost and dying world with the Gospel of Christ. You need to, yes, have friends that don't share the, the same viewpoint. In fact, you need to care more about that person than you care about being right. I mean, when you get into an argument with someone about, uh, let's say this topic, same-sex marriage, and they don't agree with you on it, are you just simply just cut off that friendship because they don't agree with you on that issue? Absolutely not. Love that individual more than you love the, the, the being right, more than you love the issue itself. Stay friends with that individual. We accomplish nothing by isolating ourselves from those who don't agree with us. And the church has gotten a bad rap for that because essentially we've said we're staying away from all of you sinners because we're not. But the reality is I am a sinner saved by God's grace. And one of the, again, we need to be insulted like Christ was insulted. Remember when the Pharisees, the, the religious gas bags, when they want to insult Jesus, they called him a friend of sinners. That'd be a great insult for us to have, for the legalists to say they hang out with sinners. I, let me give you just a, an extreme example of this. Um, it was actually in our last session of God's at War, but it's a ministry I've heard of before. It's called Triple uh, X Church, xxxchurch.com. And uh, I came across them when I was a youth pastor, and we were studying purity um, for our teens. And this ministry, what they do is they go to uh, porn conventions and they minister to those individuals. And, uh, for example, um, 
<clears throat> they'll, they'll, uh, d- different girls will be walking by and they'll tell them, you know, if you're tired uh, of, of men touching you at this convention and bothering you at this convention, we have ladies in the, lest- in the restroom who want to minister to you and want to help you and want to tell you that Christ loves you. They have Bibles that they hand out. On one side it says the Holy Bible, on the other side it says Jesus loves porn stars. And Jesus loves porn stars. He loves, he loves those who struggle with sin. He loves the drug addict. He loves the prideful. He loves all of us, church. And this ministry gets more criticism from Christians than any ministry that I've followed. In fact, on their Facebook page, I would encourage you to like it. Um, they talk about the insults of the week that they get from quote-unquote Christians because they go to places where nobody else would go. But isn't that what we're supposed to do? Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. Who did he come for? The sick. So the healthy have no need of a physician. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinner. And so when you cut off those who disagree with you, you essentially are saying, you're not worth my time to give you the greatest message the world has ever known because you're different than me. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I looked around at my friends, and almost all my friends are Christians. And my prayer is, is that that will change. Not that I'm getting rid of some of you, because there's only like two of you. Brandon, are you still my friend? <laughs> okay, I have one friend. My wife. You're still my friend. Okay. Whew. Even my own son. I'll, I'll go to Rhett and say, are you my buddy? And he goes, no. I'm not your buddy. <laughs> so I'm down to one. I looked around and most of the people I hang out with are are Christians and that's not always a bad thing but as a Christian I need to have a broader base of people I'm interacting with and it's so easy for us as Christians to be in a comfort zone instead of stepping out for those who desperately need the truth so I'm critical in my judgment when I cut off those who disagree with me people will disagree with us And that's okay. We need to give them hope. We need to give them the message of Christ. Next, I, 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 how do I know if I'm critical in my judgment? Um, You gossip. I hate gossip. Anybody else hate gossip in here? Just kind of raise your hand, shake your head. Gossip's stupid. Okay, it's dumb. It's hurtful. It's idiotic, and it is one thing that um, we absolutely do not put up with at Bridgeway. If you want to be confronted by Pastor Brent in a way that is not so loving, loving in a, you know, straightforward kind of way, then gossip about people. None of us in here are perfect. Take your halo off for a second. We all are struggling every day to be more like Christ. And what gossip does, you see, what you see in Matthew 7 is a confrontation. Ultimately, Jesus is saying, you're talking to this individual about sin. It's confrontational. It's person to person. What gossip does is instead of talking person to person, you talk to everybody else about that person. That's what gossip is. It's here's the issue this person has that they're struggling with, and they're a bad person for it. That kind of ties in with uh, number one, being enraged about someone else's sin more than you're embarrassed by your own. Gossip does not seek to help. It seeks to destroy and enjoys it when it happens. Gossip has destroyed many a church. And by God's grace, it will not destroy Bridgeway. If you ever want to get yourself kicked out of church, then gossip and refuse to stop. So you can't kick people out. Sure we can. If you're going to be like that, again, I don't pastor wolves. Pastor sheep, right? You shoot wolves, right? That's what you're supposed to do. So at the end of the day, to be unrepentant about something that could potentially destroy a church we don't put up with that. We're a bunch of non-perfect sinners here trying to do the right thing. The last thing we need is to get a gun and shoot each other uh, friendly fire. You know, Christians are great at friendly fire. Instead of helping someone who's, who's basically in the pit and saying, let me get down there and help you out, no, friendly fire. Now, I will say we don't have that issue at this church at this point, maybe because I talk like this about it. I don't know. <laughs> maybe people are too scared to say such things, which is fine. Uh, when it comes to gossip, but the reality is, if you want to be critical in your judgment, then you gossip about people. 
Church, we can't do that. We mustn't do that. Number four. I don't know if I mean critical my judgment. You refuse to correct someone's wrong belief or wrong position. And this, my friends, is not an easy, easy one. It's not an easy one at all. Again, our faith was never meant to be private. It was meant to be a public thing. In fact, it was, it, being a Christian is meant to define every aspect of your life. I mean, Jesus, when he's preaching the crowds, he gets extreme. He basically tells them, if you don't love me more than you love your own family, you're not worthy of me. If you won't pick up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. So what Jesus is saying, you come to me, I get everything. And what we find out is that's the best decision a person can make. Because when I put my life in my hands, the outcome is not, not so nice. You refuse to correct someone's wrong belief or position. And Basically, you refuse to speak up. And I think Christians don't do this for a couple of reasons. They don't want to be seen as, as unloving. You know, when it comes to this issue of, of same-sex marriage, Brent, it's just two people who love each other. I mean, why would you want to interfere with that? Uh, again, uh, who am I going to go with on this? Uh, society's opinion or what God's Word has to say? I, I have to go with God's Word. If I'm going to be a follower of Christ, He said... Why do you call me Lord and do not the things which I say? In fact, to have the truth and not tell someone is probably the most unloving thing you can do. So your fear of being considered unloving by society, in fact, you're really being unloving by God's standards by not sharing the truth, which was basically hatred. Or maybe you simply don't believe what the Bible has to say is true. Like Brent, you know, I love the parts about love and forgiveness, but let's not talk about God's wrath. Let's not talk about those harsh things. Again, you, you, can't, you can't pick and choose. Christ is the Lord of the whole thing, not just the parts we like and don't like. I like what uh, <clears throat> Pastor Rick Warren said when he was on Piers Morgan tonight. <laughs> I don't, I don't like Piers Morgan, all right? What, you have a British guy on America's Got Talent. That's pretty messed up itself. Um, furthermore, we have a British Spider-Man, which is outrageous. Can you believe that? I mean, it's, that's ridiculous. They had a British Spider-Man, they fired him, and what they do, they get another British Spider-Man, but that's a whole different story. Isn't, I think Superman's British too, isn't he? He's not? Okay, someone said he was. That's the case, that's just a travesty. Anyways. Let's get spiritual here, people. Uh, Piers Morgan used to have a talk show, but it, it, it stunk and nobody watched it, and they, they took it off the air. But um, he had uh, Pastor Rick Warren on there, and was talking about this issue of same-sex marriage, and he said, you know, Pastor, that you and the rest of your peers and the rest of the pastors are essentially going to have to accept this as just a fact of how society is one day. I mean, it's going to be overwhelming not in your favor when society is going completely against what you're preaching. And I love what Rick Warren said. He said, Piers, I fear the disapproval of God more than I fear the disapproval of man. Let me say that again. I fear the disapproval of God more than I fear the disapproval of man. And what it comes down to is who do you fear more? The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I don't think society offers a lot of wisdom. I mean, when we kill babies and save trees instead. I don't think there's a lot of things that make sense. And so if you are unwilling to correct someone's wrong belief, if you're unwilling to step up and say what is right, it's because you fear man and not God. And if we really believe what the Bible says... You can't be silent about it. I mean, if you believe that, that if the Bible is true, then that does mean there is an eternal hell where people will go forever. That it's real. That it exists. That what 1 Corinthians 6 says is true. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you not, do not be deceived, neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or homosexuals or sodomites or thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or extortioners will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
that if this is true, you can't be silent about it. So, Brian, I really don't like those verses. You know, the beautiful thing about 1 Corinthians 6 is after Paul says this, the, the very next verse, he says, and such were some of you. He gives this long list, and he says, that was some of you. And by God's grace, he saved you. And so when we look at these issues, and again, these people, some of you were in the same boat. All of us, in fact, were. Finally, how do I know if I'm being critical in my judgment? One, you're more angry about someone else's sin than you are your own. You cut them off. Those people, those who would disagree with you, you refuse or you gossip, and then you refuse to correct someone's wrong belief. And then finally, you completely write them off as hopeless. Right? There's nothing you can do for that person. And I've heard this before. Friend, they are too far gone. You do not know them like I know them. You do not know the stuff that they've done. They are too far gone. They're absolutely hopeless. That makes a couple assumptions. One, it assumes that God is not as powerful as he claimed to be. Well, that's not what I'm saying, Brent. That's exactly what you're saying. Because if God can create an entire universe out of absolutely nothing and not need anybody's help, if he can come and he can live and he can die and then come back to life and need nobody's help, I would say he's pretty powerful. And so if you have someone you think is a lost cause, you don't think God can do the impossible in their life, then apparently your God is not that powerful. And church said it's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, you have a guy named Saul who travels around and arrests Christians, has them killed. They read Acts chapter 7. They take a guy's clothes. They take Stephen's clothes after they killed him and laid him at this young man's feet named Saul. Acts chapter 8, you have Saul going and wreaking havoc of the church. And this is the same guy, this hopeless, lost cause, who writes two-thirds of the New Testament. Do not tell me that someone is a lost cause. Because ultimately what you're saying is God can do nothing for that individual. And who are you to say God can do nothing? Are you God? Goodness, no. Essentially what you're saying is nothing can be done for this person. Go to hell. We'll see you later. See, Jesus didn't come with that intention. Jesus didn't come to condemn people. Everybody knows John 3.16. Not many people know John 3.17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. If Jesus had come bringing condemnation, we wouldn't be here. He would have ended it all 2,000 years ago. If he came bringing condemnation on the earth, he would have condemned everybody to hell and it would have been story over. But that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to bring condemnation. He came so that people could be saved. And so if you want to be critical in your judgment and write someone off as hopeless, you essentially are saying, let's just condemn them. They're done. Let's see you later. You don't have the right nor the authority to do such a thing. And yet, this was some of the stuff Jesus was running into at that point. He was running into to, to Pharisees. If you don't know who they are, they're basically religious elitists who thought they were better than everybody else. And so put them down to make themselves look really good. They cared nothing for the people. They stole from widows. They said, you've got to tithe on this, 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 this. You have to do all of these things if you want to be holy like we are holy because this is what we do. And this is the same people Jesus gets in their face and says, you're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. You're nice on the outside, but on the inside you are full of death and decay. You make me sick. Pharisees didn't like that. But they fall in the category of people who are critical in their judgment. So Brent, <clears throat> how can I be caring in my judgment? Maybe that's a question you're asking yourself. So when it comes to judging someone, you are not to judge them critically. Whatsoever. This is what Jesus is talking about as he starts Matthew 7.1. But we get down to uh, caring judgment. And I'll show you a verse here in just a second. But it, carrying judgment always starts with a look at yourself. It always starts with yourself. Get the next slide there, Tom. Carrying judgment always starts with yourself. How many of you have ever flown on a plane? All right. And they go through this big safety thing where if the oxygen mask falls down, what are you supposed to do? You put it on yourself first and then help your child next to you. Because if you pass out, you're not going to be able to help your child anyway. 
And when we come to being caring in our judgment or in making our conclusions, you must first look at yourself before even speaking a word. We must have self-examination. Keep going, Tom. Um, I want to give you a quote real quick from a guy named Warren Wearsby, if you could bring that up. Keep going. And one more. There we go. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, the purpose of self-judgment is to prepare us to serve others. Keep that in mind. The purpose of self-judgment, again, I need to apply the same judgment to myself that I am doing to the other person. Critical judges don't do that. They apply it to the person and not to themselves. Critical, uh, the purpose of self-judgment is to prepare, prepare us to serve others. Christians are obligated to help each other grow in grace. When we do not judge ourselves, we only hurt ourselves. We not only hurt ourselves, but we also hurt those with whom we could minister. So we look at ourselves first in order that we can help the person next to us. The Pharisees didn't do that. They, may, they criticize others to make themselves ultimately look good. Now, when you are doing self-examination yourself in the light of God's word, there are two extremes that I want you to avoid. When you're looking at yourself as a believer and how you stand before God, one extreme is what I call haphazard examination. You know there's things going on in your life, but you're really not feeling up to dealing with it. It's, it's, James uh, talked about these people in James chapter 1, verse uh, 22. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So if you're willing to just hear the word but not do it, you're, you're just fooling yourself. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. He says he's basically, he's like a guy who's got dirt on his face. He looks in the mirror real fast and says, ah, you're good, and then walks away. That's someone who's just haphazard in their examination. But then there's another extreme, which I like to call the zombie effect, where you're alive spiritually, you just don't act like it. Where you're so hard on yourself that you become discouraged and defeated. Like, Brent, I am no good. How could God possibly use someone like me? Do you know what I've done? Do you know what, what I think? They're alive spiritually. They just, they're not acting like it. They're completely defeated and completely discouraged. And that's exactly how the enemy would like us to stay. And what you need to do is you need to look at Christ in faith and receive his forgiveness and receive uh, his restoration. And say, God, you can't, you, you could take what we have here and, and you could do something with it. God, you could do something that no one else could do. Without him, yes, we should be discouraged, we should be defeated, but we have a living Savior. So let him forgive you and let him restore you. So it needs to be a good balance when you're looking at yourself, when you're judging yourself. And when you have looked at yourself, you've confessed your sin, you're doing your absolute best to follow after Christ. Are you perfect? No. But you're doing the best that you can. Then, then comes caring judgment. Look at uh, Matthew 7, verse 5. Caring judgment takes action, which is the next one. So it looks at herself first and takes action afterwards. He says, Thou hip hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Keep that in mind. He didn't say, cast the beam out of your eye, tell the person they're wrong, and then just leave them there. He says, you go, you get the beam, you get right first, and then yes, you're going to pass some judgment on someone, but you're going to do it with the right heart, with the right intention. Because caring judgment doesn't seek to hurt, it seeks to help. It seeks to build up, not tear down. And so he says, you'll be able to see clearly to what? To cast out, meaning you're going to have to take action. When you tell someone they're wrong, you then need to help them with what they're dealing with. You simply just don't write them off. You take action. You care about the individual. The goal with caring judgment is ultimately someone coming to know Christ or someone being uh, healed spiritually. It's caring for the individual enough to get yourself right with God so that you can help that person. And that's where we stand as believers. You have, to, you have to pass judgment. You just have to do it the right way. You have to form a conclusion. Because how can you help someone if you don't? It's exactly what Christ did. We need, a, we need less Pharisees, and we need more 
Christ-like people to pass judgment. If I could give you one verse to walk away with today, it'd be 1 Timothy 1.15. I don't think it's on our slides. You could write it down off to the side. This is this guy whose name was Saul, and he became Paul. He said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He says, I am the greatest sinner to walk the face of the earth. He says, It's a faithful saying, worthy of all exception, meaning everybody needs to hear this, that Christ came to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. I don't think that's such a bad mindset when we get to sharing the love of Christ with those who are not like us, when we go to passing judgment in the sense of, again, helping that individual, going with the the attitude and the mindset that Christ saved me and I am the worst sinner on the face of the earth. He can help you. Let's bow this morning. Turn your eyes upon you. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strange dim in the light of his glory and grace Turn your eyes Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strange Be dim in the light of his glory and grace